I'm Roseanne Pagano. Um, David is the event designer, and then he's here to ask some questions. Um, David Scheel is an internationally ranked marine biologist who has studied the behavior and ecology of octopuses for more than 25 years. In 2019, David starred with Heidi the Octopus and his daughter, Laurel, in the PBS program Octopus Making Contact. David was an Anchorage and MPP producer of marine biology clubs for Cambridge. Looks like we're all friends here and have been for well, like pretty much decades, I think. <laughs> right, right. However, however, uh, like, yeah. We're going to start with um, the, a reading for David. Yeah, so I thought I would read from um, from chapter nine, uh, Octopus Tools. The shores of Port Graham, at the mouth of Cook Inlet, Alaska, within the traditional traditional lands of the Shuka. How did the octopus defeat the clam? It picked up the large shell. No other clam in this area grew as big as the butter clam, Saxodoma gigantea. The shell was nearly four inches in width, thick and heavy in the hand, the strong armor of a well-protected animal. Yet an octopus had gotten inside. I had picked it up from an octopus midden outside a den on a rocky beach. To get to the village of Port Graham, I took a cargo jet from Cordova to Anchorage, arriving at a large and modern airport. To get from Anchorage to Homer, I boarded an eight-seat twin-engine otter, a large prop plane. And for the final leg from Homer to Port Graham, a four-seat float plane. As I moved into successively smaller planes, I felt I was drawing closer to the Alaska I had imagined when first moved to Cordova, an Alaska of legend and dream time. The night before I found the clam, I had sat in a darkened room and listened to Simeon Kavashnikov tell the history of his family and a little bit of the Shukpak. I sat at Simeon's dinner table, looking out the picture window across the water. Shadows lengthened across the bay. They crept down the steep mountainside cloaked in brilliant green hemlock and spruce, and with a touch turned each tree deep forest black. On the near shore, the water glowed red in the long rays of the afternoon March sun. Over the window was a faux wood engraving of Christ and the apostles at the Last Supper, the exact depiction that had hung in my own dining room when I was a child, over which my brothers and I used to tuck palm fronds on Good Friday. Slightly portly, Simeon was 61, although he looked younger, with a round face, a nearly perpetual grin, and an amused crinkle around the eye. A cigarette always dangled from his mouth, although he never sucked at it. It slowly burned down and bobbed as he talked, and although I never saw him remove the butt or light a fresh cigarette, whenever one had burned down to the filter, another would mysteriously take its place. His black mustache was shot with gray and stained yellow from cigarette smoke. Beneath the cap that he was seldom without, his black hair was also now and then with a chuckle. My mom, she was strict. She raised me up right. By the time Simeon was a young man, Western ways were encroaching on the village of Cordova. Oh, Always in the West, for many years past Cordova and north as far as Inuit territory. Territories of many peoples bordered on Prince William Sound, which is a great mixing ground where the history of various groups are mingled and confused. In those days, there used to be more witches. Simeon's eyes grew distant. He told us that witches could be seen at night, as recently as when Simeon was a boy, traveling overhead in case of a small fire, headed to another village to cast us. People do not use witchcraft so much anymore, though, since the introduction of Russian orthodoxy, which is a strong attack. Simeon told us how his father, who was a reader for the church and the choir master, had succumbed to a spell and become very ill. My father lost weight until he couldn't get out of bed. Out of the window from his bed, he saw the man who had cursed him pass by, and he said to mother, call him a witch. I want to speak to him. Then my father said to him, 
look what you have done. I'm nothing but skin and bone. Wait till you see what happens to you when I ask God to help you. At this, the witch was frightened. Wait, pleaded the man. Tomorrow I will bring you some. The next day, the man returned to Simeon's house, bringing with him holy water and holy bread in a jar, which he mixed, and Simeon's father drank those down. He immediately vomited up a small octopus. The octopus had been in his stomach, eating all the food that came down. Had the octopus stayed in his stomach, uh, Simeon's dad would have continued to waste away. Simeon's father chopped the octopus into small pieces on cardboard, using a knife dipped in holy water. He sealed the pieces into a milk can, which he pounded flat and threw into the bay. A day later, the man who had cursed him became very ill, as always happens when a witch loses its power. Octopuses are also called devilfish, Simeon informed us. I asked my mother about this once, but she said there was nothing to worry about. She said, there's no devil in the octopus, else we wouldn't eat him. Simeon laughed. Simeon's tale highlights the common wild diet of octopuses and of his people. An octopus midden displays a smorgasbord of seafood remains similar in kind to those that humans also love. The accumulated midden of clam and crab remains reflects our shared preference and reveal the octopus's large appetite. And what about the octopus? How did it get into this armored prey? No doubt the octopus had simply tried pulling on the large butter clam to pry uh, on the large butter clam shell to pry apart the two halves. Octopuses have hundreds of suckers in two rows along each of their eight arms. The suckers are small near the mouth, becoming larger and moving outward until they become smaller again towards the arm tips. Arms of the giant Pacific octopus bear about 115 sucker pairs, or 230 suckers per arm, which works out to just under 2,000 suckers. The male's third right arm, modified for reproduction, bears fewer suckers. These suckers can adhere with surprising force. A tenacious grip from even one sucker will raise a small welt on a forearm. Each sucker has a two-chamber anatomy, more complex than a simple dome suction cup like you might buy in a store. These complexities allow the muscular action of the suction cup to draw a strong vacuum on the water inside the cup taking advantage of not only octopus strength, but also the capillary forces that act on water in small spaces, and of hair-like microstructure surfaces that seal the inner chamber underwater. The pressure difference between that vacuum inside and the water pressure outside hold the sucker rim to the surface. In shallow water, the limitation of sucker holding force is the cavitation strength of water itself. That is, the water inside the sucker behaves a bit like a solid, resisting any expansion in volume until an expansion force is so great that the water cavitates. Microscopic bubbles grow rapidly under negative pressure that finally allow the volume inside the suction cup to increase. At anything less than that high level of force, the suction cup holds tight. The octopus does not have to continue to work and holding on. The water tension inside the sucker also maintains the contraction of the sucker anatomy itself, even when the octopus relaxes. This is how the octopus can cling to a surface while relaxed or asleep. Octopus suckers adhere to anything they touch. I once gave Obi, a young day octopus, a toy to explore in her aquarium. The toy was a Mr. Potato Head, with pink ears, big red nose, eyes, and other body part pieces plugged in. I had put a piece of shrimp inside the toy, through the storage hatch in the potato's backside. The plastic potato was as large as the octopus. Intrigued, but cautious, Obi slowly stretched out an arm. Mr. Potato Head was not well weighted and barely rested on a sucker or two adhered to the smooth plastic surface of the toy. On contact, Obi pulled the arm back, startled, but the sucker didn't release, and so Mr. Potato Head approached Obi. 
uh, Mr. Potato Head approached. Obi, now detached, leapt back in alarm. Without the arm pulling on it, Mr. Potato Head drifted to a stop. The sequence repeated, startling the hesitant octopus a second time. Still, this large and vaguely aggressive object commanded Obi's attention. On the third exploration, Obi approached in dramatic guise, with her mantle darkly veined against a white background, and her arms black, except for contrasting rows of white spots. With her rear forearms on the rock and substrate, she raised her front forearms above her eyes, web splayed wide along the arm edges. Mr. Potato Head missed the drama of this moment, as it had drifted face down and was staring into the sand. With her arms spread this way, lined with adhering suckers ready to resist any escape attempt, Obi's gape was larger than Mr. Potato Head, larger indeed than Obi herself. The arms, surrounding the mouth as they do, extended as prehensile lips as much as they do limbs, and they were now poised to engulf Mr. Potato Head. On first contact, however, again, Obi's suckers adhered and this large but light object approached Obi, seemingly of its own volition. Obi's nerve failed, and she retreated nearer her lair. Mr. Potato had drifted closer before coming to a stop, and she eyed him warily, having yet to discover that his various parts pulled out in tempting ways, and that there was indeed a morsel to eat inside his hard but oddly lightweight shell. Obi was still learning with her suckered grasp, about light toys in captivity. She would later enjoy engulfing Mr. Potato Head in her web and disassembling his parts. The giant Pacific octopus of Port Graham that had defeated the butter clam mentioned earlier had taken the heavy bivalve in its suckered arms, but she was to learn the limits of her strength. With many suckers on multiple arms attached around both halves of the clamshell, the octopus no doubt had tried to pull open this armored prey, perhaps with some patience. The sucker attachment requires no persistent force, but the octopus has to pull continuously with its arms to pry apart the clam halves, while the clam resists, applying opposing force to hold itself closed. In its battle with this large butter clam, the octopus tired first. The clam was too strong and did not yield to the octopus's strength. So the octopus tried something else. On the outside of the clamshell were no fewer than five separate marks. Two marks on one half of the clamshell, and three marks on the other side. The marks were small ovals made by the giant Pacific octopus. Each of these was an attempt by the octopus to get through the shell. These tiny oval perforations are drill marks. The octopuses have inside their mouths a radula which is a rasping organ used to break up food. The radula apparatus is a distinctive adaptation found only in the mollusks. The radula itself is a ribbon-like membrane that runs between two muscle groups and lies over in between the bolsters, two muscular hydrostats. Our human tongue, as well as octopus arms, and the elephant's trunk are muscular hydrostats. Anatomical constructions that use fluid pressure generated by muscle contraction rather than a rigid skeleton to allow movement. Inside the octopus mouth, the bolsters can direct the pressure of a bend in the radula ribbon. Along the length of the radula are rows of micro teeth. Muscles at either end pull the radula back and forth, rasping it over and wearing away the surface against which it is applied. On the larger butter clam, not one of the five drill marks penetrated the shell. None had made it through to the interior. The octopus spent many frustrating hours in its den, eroding these holes into the shell, but always tired too soon. Five attempts to drill into the armor failed, yet the octopus still was not defeated. On the rim of the clam, where the two halves met opposite the hinge, I found small marks. The mark on the left lined up with the mark on the right, leaving a tiny gap to the interior of the shell. 
The mouth of the octopus contains a black and chitinous beak, reminiscent of a parrot's, but more fully surrounded by muscle. While squid beaks are often very sharp, useful for tearing into the soft flesh of the fish that comprise their diet, those of octopuses are worn and blunt from applying force to hard shells. After a long battle using suckers and arms, radula and saliva, the octopus had beaten the clam by biting with its beak and was finally able to chip the edge of the shell at its thinnest point. Even though the chip was small, it exposed the inner clam flesh. This allowed the octopus to inject saliva that paralyzed the clam and weakened the connection between shell and muscle. Many prey do not present the challenge of this heavy butter clam. We find drilled clams and crabs quite often without marks of multiple failed attempts. The shells of the larger helmet crabs are lightweight compared to other crabs, and in this same midden were numerous helmet crab legs. Octopuses do not trouble to drill these crabs through the carapace. Instead, they bite through a leg to open them, leaving a telltale mark, or they simply rip open the crab with arms and suckers. Interestingly, young octopuses used to eating crabs subdue their first Pacific Little Neck clams by drilling. But later they learn to pull these open, which they do in seconds. Octopuses are well-equipped hunters with a formidable toolkit of body parts to defeat the heavy armor of their prey. The radula and sal salivary papillae for drilling through the shells, the beak for chipping shells, and the force of the suckers for pulling apart prey. This flexibility of methods is characteristic of the octopus, possessed of curiosity to investigate of fierce impatience and persisting to the end, together with the will to abandon one approach or another and another until the meal is won. However, octopuses are not only the hunter, they are also the hunted. Thank you. It was a lovely start to the book. Um, and um, thank you for reading. I, I wonder if we could um, just pause for a moment and think about one of those last sentences. Um, and without putting, but I know biologists will tell me I can't be clear about this, but bear with me. Um, without putting too much of the anthropomorphism here, doesn't this sound like a Spielman study? Um, this flexibility of methods is characteristic of creepy-dissenting humans. Um, possessed of curiosity to investigate, a fearsome patience and persisting to the end, together with the will to abandon one approach or another and another until the battle is won. Um, is it fair to say that, again, without you know, pushing you for an answer, but is this partly what intrigues you about these creatures that I like to deduce your characteristics of us? Or am I reading too much? No, you're, you're reading closely. Um, you know, one of the places I was trying to go with this book is to kind of try and meet the octopus, not as some human who wants to be the intelligent, rational species and everything else is something else. So we get people saying octopuses are entirely alien and things like that. And not as some student of nature, although I am, who just sits wide-eyed and slack-jawed in, in awe of everything. Um, but to really just try and say, you know, where does, what does the octopus do without a lot of interpretation? You know, like, what's really going on here if we try and strip away saying flat out, oh, the octopus is smart, or oh, the octopus is a mollusk? And, um, you know, it seems to me that that uh, it does have these properties of curiosity, persistence, and flexibility. Um, you know, the octopus is sort of the example animal of flexibility. A lot of animals have curiosity. Um, so there's nothing uh, remarkable in the animal world about that. But I'm trying to say that in, this, in, in the face of, of these audiences that I know will span you know, um, other, other octopus biologists, my professional colleagues in the sciences who will, who 
who will read this with that critical don't anthropomorphize your animal kind of point of view, all the way to people who uh, do want to sit, you know, in awe of nature and, and not, not analyze, not try and reduce, not try and uh, pick apart. And um, so I'm, I'm faced with that challenge of how to write to these diverse audiences. And I'm, I'm sure there are many, many excellent solutions. But I've never taken your courses. I never, I wasn't taught them. And so, and so instead, I, I, my own approach is just to get there slowly, right? And so this is one of those points where, you know, yes, the close reader ought to be seeing humanity in there. Many times I've been asked um, by people, just how smart is an octopus, anyway? And uh, my answer usually has to do with, well, they're curious, they're persistent, and they're flexible. And what does that make? That's exactly the same kind of uh, intelligence that humans have. Right? We claim to be rational, and we can do that if we're forced. And every one of you who's sat down in a math class and said, oh, this is exhausting, know what I mean. <laughs> and you know we can be rational, but mostly we love to explore and tinker and tweak and experiment and poke and prod and see what happens. That's trying out a whole bunch of things and learning from what happens. There's a, there's a moose walking by out the window, so I'm just enjoying the view over your shoulders. Uh, uh, come on in. You can you can learn about octopuses too. Yeah, that might be hard to find. That's a good point. So, so yeah, I, I do think that. Part so, David, going does that what you just said? Does that um, explain um, this? Um, you have these different audiences in mind. Does that partly explain for, for maybe as the student writers here um, why you um, you're you're trying to be like um, a little backward? You, you tell us the story of Jacinta, for example, mm -hmm. and. Who's reading and they're thinking, okay, David, where are you going with this? Whatever happened to the clan? Um, so if you did that, study that, I would see the world as you're seeing it. That that story of Simone is and the witch and the the vomiting up of the octopus. What is the point of that, David? Why would you do that? So there's an octopus in the story. Yes. So, so that <laughs> that's where we start. So the story is in there because it has an octopus in it. Okay. Got it. So Simeon's in there because he tells the story. So that's where the story comes from. Um, the, the reason to put that story in the book is because it illustrates the great similarity. Uh, the octopus is in there eating everything Simeon's father eats, eating everything he knows. It illustrates the commonality of diet, of hunger, of appetite. And later on in the book, I talk about the importance of appetites because curiosity is an appetite, right? Hunger is an appetite. Um, you know, the urge to mate is an appetite. It's, you, you have to do it, and then it subsides for a while, and then it comes back, right, at different levels. And so one of the things that I talk about later on in the book is you know, what can we say or what can we know about animal emotions? Animals chase down their prey, they eat voraciously, then they fall asleep. They clearly have appetites. They clearly get hungry, they clearly fall asleep, they get sleepy. And yet, there are studies and writing by scientists who probably ought to know better that say things like, the octopus doesn't experience hunger. The longer they go without food, the less likely they are to seek food. And that's just, I've never encountered that in any animal in my life. It doesn't make any ecological sense or biological sense or evolutionary sense. And when I first read that, I didn't really have enough experience with octopuses to say, that's, I've seen it, that's wrong. I can say that now, I've seen it, that's wrong. Okay. They're very, you know, they, they go longer without food. They're more likely to take food just like any other animal. And that means they have appetites. That means they have a sensation in the internal world. 
but they have to match to the external world. And that's what emotions are. They're drives. And so, um, I want to understand if, if what, what you are describing is between experts. Is that where um, the behavioral ecologists come in and trying to understand adaptation, how it is a creature um, kind of operates with these appetites and navigates, has agency with these appetites and navigates this world? Yeah, behavioral ecology, I mean, formally, it's the relationship of organisms, well, animals with behavior in this case, animals to their environment. That's ecology, organisms to their environment. Behavioral ecology is how the behaviors uh, are shaped by the ecology of the animal, by natural selection and evolution to uh, aid the animal, you know, to, to function for the animal. Right? We talk about the fit of form and function. Well, behaviors have forms as well. Things that are work well for that animal to succeed um, and that it are part of its evolutionary paths. Um, and when I studied behavioral ecology as a graduate student, which is now you know, a few years back, um, we didn't talk about the inner lives of animals. We didn't, we really needed philosophy of science to do some more work um, and bring that question closer to a scientific question. It was just seen as very speculative. It, it wasn't that we denied, there's often this sense of, oh, behaviorists are always denying the inner life of animals. I think that's a misconstrual of the status of the theory at the time that it was attributed. I'm sure individual writers denied it, but, but the status of the theory at that time did not deny it. It simply said, why don't we solve the problems that are visible and external to the animal where we don't have to be reading its thoughts first? And if we get that sorted out, we'll see if we can make any grounds on its internal life. But in the last, you know, in the last 20 years or so, um, philosophy made a lot of progress on those questions. Shockingly, after 2,000 years, made a lot of progress on those questions in the 80s and the 90s, uh, stimulated by people like Daniel Dennett, um, uh, Derek Denton, uh, and my collaborator and colleague Peter Godfrey Smith is making contributions still, and um, brought those questions to a point where I think the scientists could actually begin to see how to apply facts to those questions rather than speculation. And um, also, if I understand right, there have been any number of, um, not just theory, but so there, we have new ways of understanding octopus, is that right? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, uh, earlier today, our, our wonderful librarian here, so one of the things I should say about this book is, um, in the back, you, you were talking about eddies and side notes and yes. things like that. In the back is, is a, effectively a chapter full of hundreds of notes. And some of them are strictly references. Where did this fact come from that I, I want? But some of them are additional eddies and backwaters and side notes. And that entire note section relied heavily on uh, the Consortium Libraries, Interlibrary Loan Services, where I would constantly be sending them requests and then, you know, with shocking speed, frightening speed, they returned my request. So I sent some off yesterday it was yesterday, Wednesday, right? So if I sent them off yesterday, I'd probably send them off towards the end of the day. And around 9 o'clock this morning, the, 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 the papers that I'm looking for started coming in from these obscure journals that I can't find online, but bang, here they are. So anyway, um, I have to recollect where I was going with this. Notes. Yes. Uh, so anyway, in, in the notes are some of those... Uh, I'm sorry, what was your original question again? Uh, uh, I was asking got about lost. Happens, um, the, uh, and it's a terrible pun, Eddie's why did I do it? I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, I was asking, you were saying that philosophy um, has helped us understand. My understanding from the book is that in your career, yes. that there have been other these technologies New that ways. has helped us understand. Yes. What, what is that? So, so um, the reason I told the uh, back Eddie of, of the library is, this morning in those papers I received, I was looking for a definition of a particular group of octopuses called the Harlequin octopus. And they're called that because they have bold black markings on them in high contrast with white or paler cloth. 
colors. And there's one species that's very, um, uh, it's a focus of a lot of work right now. Uh, octopus churchia, the pygmy zebra octopus. And so I was trying, and it's a harlequin octopus, and I was like, well, okay, but who are the harlequin octopus? I know, I know what they are, these boldly marked species, but how many species are there? And I knew there was um, this pygmy zebra octopus and its, its sister species, if you will, the larger Pacific striped octopus. And I thought there was maybe one other species. And I found it is called Octopus zonatus. I found that yesterday. And then this morning, I'm digging back from a paper published in 2020 to one published in 1954 to one published in 1898 looking for where do we talk about Harlequin octopus, and this species pops up um, that it's been written about like this much, and it's described according to uh, its internal organs and what it looks like after it's been pickled in preservation. Right? And that was how they were able to describe octopus species back then, because nobody could keep them alive once you pluck them out of the ocean. And they need to be vouchered in museums if you're going to do any serious taxonomic work on octopuses at all, and so they preserve them in formal and in alcohol, and they send them to the Smithsonian, and, and they're there, and so the 1858 or 1898 octopus was in the Smithsonian, and the 1954 author had gone and looked at it and described it. And then I'm looking at the 2020 paper, and they have described the octopus. And they sort of sound the same only they're going by different names. Only the newer paper only used characters of the living animal to describe it. External characters based on body pattern, things that change constantly moment by moment to the octopus, but there are characteristic patterns that are absolutely specific to one species. The older papers only used the dead characters. So I might have to go to the Smithsonian to be able to compare and overlap them, having seen the living one. But from the literature, the techniques have changed so much that you can no longer necessarily even tell. This, this new species, the live one that was described, the larger Pacific striped octopus, it's never been form formally, or formally described in the literature with a species description. So it has no species name. But it's recognized as a distinct species that has recently been discovered by science. But here's something sitting in the Smithsonian that, as far as I can tell, is caught from a region that might be within the range of the species, is very distinctive, and sounds like the living guy. And so, you know, that, that's how much the techniques have changed. And, and that, that has to do with developments in aquarium science, right? And it has to do with developments in photography, it has to do with developments in um, scuba diving, all of which kind of, okay, now we can keep the animals alive, we can photograph them underwater, we can see what they do in the natural world, but also developments in philosophy, like understanding consciousness, developments in genetics, physiology, microscopy. This is all in the course of essentially your career. Yeah, yeah, essentially from the 80s till now, so the last 40 years or so. Let me ask um, maybe just a couple of questions, and I'd love to hear from you all. Um, tell me about um, octopus skin. Yeah, um, octopus skin is very dynamic. It's uh, it's very changeable, and it's together with the other cephalopods, it's completely unique in the animal kingdom. It's um, several different layers, um, three different color layers, and then a um, a scattering layer that looks white, and then under that a reflective layer that can make. Uh, um, refractive colors, like uh, really brilliant blues and things like that. So this is cloud display? Is that yeah, and so they have these three different layers in the skin, and all of the layers, whether they're exposed to the surface or not, is all regulated by, by many, many, many tiny little muscles. And all of the units are tiny, little, you know, little pinpricks, little pixels. And they can turn on and off all of these pixels in all of these different layers, as fast as I can talk or wave my hands at you. And so it, it's able to change its appearance with that kind of rapidity and ease. And so an octopus doesn't sort of 
like a chameleon, adopt one color and hold on to it for a while, and then change. I saw octopuses alive before I'd ever seen chameleons change color. And I was just shocked. Chameleons are so slow. Painful. Very painful. Get an octopus every time <laughs> for color change. Well, okay. Um, since we're thinking about um, something artistic here, tell me about the, the, the drawings and about royalties. So the drawings are done by a, a wonderful artist. Uh, Surely the best one you know. Surely. Happens to be uh, daughter. These ones. Are they children uh, here? They are. She she draws uh, like a like a young, hip, modern artist. She draws on the computer, <laughs> stylus, uh, directly into uh, Photoshop. Yeah. So they're done by, by my daughter, Laurel, and um, she is just finishing art up art school right now in, in Minneapolis. Um, and she also starred with me in, in the, um, the documentary about the octopus, Heidi. And uh, the process that we went through is I, I read the chapters aloud as I was, um, as I was coming to the, the first full draft of the book to both of my girls, Laurel and Juniper. And uh, Juniper uh, criticized me about anything anthropological every place where I didn't uh, treat indigenous cultures and history with the appropriate level of uh, grammatical respect and, and so on. And Laurel sketched. And she made hundreds of sketches. And then we went chapter by chapter and just flipped through them. And I, and I said, OK, what about developing that one, that one, that one, that one? And then I gave her reference material to try and get everything to look as uh, octopus accurate as we could manage. And then I sent her away, and she did the sketches. And the, the wonderful thing about working with Laurel, and I've worked with a lot of different artists to draw pictures of octopus beha uh, behavior. And every single time, um, I would have to do a sketch to correct the artist about how the behavior actually looked, despite them having reference material and all of that. I would have to, and I'm terrible at sketching. I, this is not my skill. Um, but I would send the artist, you know, one of these really rough sketches and say, look, you gotta, you got to get this detail, and you got to get that detail, labels and arrows and everything everywhere. Uh, and then the artist would correct it, and we would go through multiple rounds of correction until it sort of looked right to me. Because artists have never seen this before. A lot of what I'm describing are getting drawn. The reason I wanted to get it drawn is because no one has ever documented it before. It's never been filmed before. It's just never been seen before. And uh, Laurel grew up with octopuses. Uh, she knows how they move. She knows what they feel like. She knows the sounds they make. She's seen them uh, for hours and hours moving around underwater. So she really has an intuitive sense of what the lines of, you know, with artists, I guess you talk about the, the dynamic lines, like where is the motion, where is the tension, where are the muscles tense? Where are they relaxed? And there's all these kind of use of lines to convey power and motion and action. Most of the artists that you hire to draw an octopus are going to use those lines as though they belong to a vertebrate or a human. Laurel has seen enough octopuses to use them the way that an octopus does. And it's different. And so I didn't have to coach her. They just came out right the first time. They're, they're, they really feel, um, again, so sorry for the pun, like quite organic with the um, David, I, um, you, you touched on this notion of curiosity, and I wonder if I could ask you to read just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have some questions about curiosity. Um, I want you to take a look at just the first one, just the first few, uh, paragraphs of the introduction, and if you would start and um, just um, keep it at the, the same. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm reading from the introduction, uh, not to brag, but check out the that was cute. No, it really that was Laurel's. Um, she had seen Heidi. Um, uh, the, the octopuses can reach into their gill slits with their own arms, and they can clean out their own organs. So, like their organs are just in there, exposed to the seawater, and so they can reach in and massage their stomach and wipe their gills down and things like that. And so they do that periodically. And sometimes when they do that, if they take a deep breath and blow really hard, 
an arm tip will come out the siphon where they're exhaling. And she wanted to draw that, so this is not a charming little one. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so not everyone will appreciate what that is going on in that little drawing, but it's darling. Anyway, introduction. The Inner Lives of Octopuses. This is a title, by the way, in the book proposal I sent to my agent. And I was like, I don't know what to call this section. I could call it The Inner Lives of Octopuses, but I really don't like that. And she was like, that's perfect. So that's why that's there. <laughs> the Inner Lives of Octopuses. Underwater in Prince William Sound, South Central Alaska. I followed the octopus into the emerald void between the surface and the depths. Above us in sunlight, the water sparkled with tiny glassy plankton of some sort. Below us, the light vanished in darkening green over the flats just out of sight. I swam parallel with the octopus, finning hard to match his pace. The octopus was a large juvenile male of perhaps 20 pounds and missing his second right arm. He planed backwards through the water, mantle first, then eyes and head, arms trailing. His web was flattened into a hydrofoil, web membrane extended, stump and three arms above, four arms below. His mantle expanded and then contracted powerfully, expelling the water from his siphon as he jetted over the distant silted bottom. The octopus pitched his body downward, and we descended. He neared the bottom at a depth of about 40 feet and abruptly blanched white. He spread his arms and wept wide, then grabbed hold of some kelp. With phantasms racing, white phantasm raced out of his blanched skin, chased by incoming waves of burnt and red ochre. In a second, he matched the surrounding laminarialized kelp. He pulled a broad kelp blade over his head. I have disappeared, he seemed to say. The kelp blade covered his eyes, head, and much of his central body, yet he was still quite apparent. His arms and the back of his mantle remained outside the umbrella of the kelp. I lowered myself as close to the bottom as I could in my bulky dive gear, pressed my cheek down, and peeked under his chosen shroud. A black, horizontal pupil gazed back, lid slightly lowered, papillae raised in horns over each eye. Unnoting me, one arm curled across the eye as though he didn't want me to see him hiding there, but not very well. At that time, I had barely begun training as a scientific diver, and I was new to octopuses. I left him then as I headed up to the surface, to air, light, and warmth above. I was curious about everything I had seen, from the backward and flattened swimming posture, to the wash of colors over the skin, the missing limb, and perhaps most of all, that hidden eye peering from under the kelp, peering out from behind his own suckers. I'm so taken with that picture because um, it, um, number one, just there's a sense of really the tone and the content of the entire work that's right in the book. But David, um, I'm picturing you at the bottom, cheek to the, near the eyes. Um, tell me about um, the, the connection between curiosity and patience. Um, those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about curiosity and patience. We want our students to be to have a sense of curiosity, but to be curious also requires that they're patient with themselves and, and the curve of learning. Um, and I think it's such a lovely if that makes sense to you. Yeah. So tell me something about um, is it cause and effect curiosity and patience? Is that just a trait that these two traits would be born with and so they're well suited to this profession and maybe taught? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I was born with very much patience. I don't think my mother would say I was born uh, with very much patience. Um, do you think about I'm, I'm still impatient sometimes. So, I, you know, what that tells me, I think, is that is that patience can be learned somehow. Whether you can teach it, maybe, is another question. But I do think that curiosity sustains patience. Um, if you weren't patient, you wouldn't ever, uh, I mean, if you weren't curious, you wouldn't ever have the motivation to wait and see how things develop or wait and see how things turn out. So there's, there's sort of a, 
different kinds of patients. I mean, I probably have more patients in the realm of patients to let things develop and see what comes next. Because that's what science does? But yeah, I suppose so. Then I have for like patients for someone else to get to the same point so we can move forward together kind of thing, right? So, you know, you got to have multiple kinds of patients as a teacher, uh, both the, the, the patients to give your students room to go through their own learning curve, whatever it is, um, but again, also that patience to um, continue exploring even when you don't get, you, you want an answer, and you're exploring to get the answer, but the answer hasn't come yet. You know? And that's where I'm at, for example, with my definition of Harlequin octopuses and, and what's going on with those two, the new and the old. My patience is, you know, I, I might have to wait till I get to the Smithsonian to figure that out. And I might need collaborators to figure that out. So I, I need my curiosity, but it's no good if I don't also have the patients. Right. Well, and you see where I'm headed with this. Not only is it the lives of teachers, and, and I'm wondering about that, but and surely this is true of octopus. Right. You must be both curious, how am I going to get at this food, and how patient to keep drilling. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, the, that shell, that one shell that I found, you know, two decades ago. Oh, I do, somewhere, yeah. Like nearly three decades ago now, counting on my fingers here. Um, that shell is just remarkable. I mean, it's just an incredible artifact because there's no doubt the octopus would try and pull on it. That's a given. It doesn't leave any marks, but that's like an obvious thing that they're going to do. But then to find these five attempts, each of which you know takes time, and uses all of this complicated apparatus uh, in, the, in the mouth that, and, you know, the octopuses no doubt do that ex instinctively, but they still have to work at it. They still have to try it. And the octopus knew this was food, and yet never quite got through with it, and didn't abandon it, but then, like, chipped away at it. Found another way. And found another way, yeah. One of the things, though, I, I use the word patience in that sentence. But I have to wonder whether the patience of an octopus is like the patience that we have. So like, I once watched a, an octopus. I recorded some video, and I watched an octopus. This is related to another point in the, in the book, but it pertains to patience as well. Um, the octopus comes on the screen, and it's carrying something. And it drops it. And when it drops it, you can see it's a little scalp. And the octopus sits down nearby. And after 10 minutes or something like that, the scallop swims up, and the octopus catches it again, and then it drops it. And then after another 10 minutes or so, the scallop swims up again, and the octopus reaches out and tries to get it, and it misses, and the scallop like skews over there. And the octopus gets up and chases it over there and catches it for the third time, and then drops it again. Why doesn't it eat it? But more to the point about, and, and I, I relate that later in the book, what, what I think is going on. But to the point about patience, you have to wonder, is this a patient octopus and a patient scallop? Or are they just like living in the moment? <laughs> they're, not, they're not waiting for the reward. They're just like, oh, that looks like food. Uh, I'm not hungry. Oh, that looks like food. Uh, maybe later. You know, and just like living in the moment, where they're not, so, so I, if you, if you succeed to really and completely live in the moment, then patience emerges but doesn't have a process or a name. It's just a, it's an artifact of living in the moment that you, you won't have any impatience because you're in the moment. You're not worried about what's coming next or how soon it's coming. And, and you really ascribe all that to the uh, the Many years ago, in the development of this book, I, I had this very long essay. My, um, my editor said, more science, less, uh, what was the word he used? Um, less autobiography, or less memoir. That was it. More science, less memoir, was what he said uh, to get us to the book that you have to read. Um, but in there, I was uh, uh, speculating about um, 
reading some philosophy and reading some uh, you know, Buddhist works and um, uh, what it was like to be an octopus. And one of the things that made it into that sort of sequence of, of the writing that didn't make it into the book was, was kind of a, a bit about how, you know, perhaps the octopus is like to be born in the moment and never and its experience of the world is like that. Why would you? Well, you know, I gave it to um, Cy Montgomery, who wrote an octopus book, um, Soul of an Octopus. Uh, and uh, this was while she was writing Soul of an Octopus. That's when I got it. And um, at some point, I got uh, bold enough to say, would you, would you read um, something? And she agreed that she read it. It was one of two alternate endings that I was toying with when I, I asked her, which ending did you like better? And she said, why not use them both? We have three minutes. I absolutely want to get to your questions. Um, I have too many questions at the moment, so bear with me for a moment. Can you keep this thing on for a week? Um, Besides the octopus, do any of the other multi-legged mollusks have high intelligence? Uh, is there a whole range of intelligences among them? Well, the um, cuttlefish and squid uh, are progressively more schooling animals. Cuttlefish don't always school, and squid don't always school, but they school a lot. And the schooling animal, I tend to think of them more like our herd forming animals on, uh, in, in, in land, on land. So that, you know, uh, you can sort of think of if the octopus is this lone predator, you know, like a, a coyote or a fox or something, right, making its way in the world, then the squids are sort of like cows, you know. It's not that they're not intelligent, but they live in the... the, the up off the bottom, the epibenthic, we call it, but in the water column. The octopus lives on the ground like we do. It's got to navigate around things. It can explore things. Its vision is blocked by obstacles, et cetera, et cetera. Squid, they live in above the ground, right? Like in the water column. And so the only thing they orient to really is other squid uh, and then away from predators and things. And so, to some extent, they need the same kind of intelligence that herd animals need. Which isn't to say that herd animals aren't smart. They can be, but it's a different kind of smart. And um, so we don't see that flexibility. We don't necessarily see that persistence. A squid is a lot more runaway than an octopus is. Um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, so, so they just express it differently. One of the interesting things about animals is they're all intelligent enough to be here, mm -hmm. right? And so when we talk about, I always kind of struggle when scientists and other people say, oh, that's a smart animal. It's like, in their environment, pretty much all of them are smart. Pretty much all of them are using their brain power to solve the problems they need to solve every single day. Yeah. And Yeah, and what we, what we think of as the intelligent animal is the animal who has to solve problems that look familiar and challenging to us. Mm -hmm. Opening a jar. We all know how difficult that is. Mm -hmm. So if an octopus can do it, way to go, octopus. Or hide. Or hide. Hiding is challenging. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, more science, less memoir. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Why? What was... So, um... Are you asking what about science? No, like why, um, what was the impulse that this editor was following in terms of audience engagement? Or yeah, so, so the players in this game are, are me, Cy Montgomery, my reprehensible representation, which is my agent and agency, and my editor, um, God, his name will come to me in a minute, but for right now I'm drawing a blank because it hasn't come up in a few months, John Glussman. There he is, John Glassman, and my editor at Norton, John Glassman. So I had written at the behest of my reprehensible representation um, this 50-page book proposal, which included a marketing proposal, a description of the content, 
um, table of contents, sample chapters, and an opening vignette for every chapter, along with the, um, the, the a short description of what the rest of the book, the chapter would be about. I'm beginning. From this vignette, I will now describe the science of X, right? Um, and at some point, I asked my representation, who was like making, revise, revise, the proposal, not the book. I already had 70% of the book written. Uh, and um, finally I said, you know, this is 50 pages long now. Don't we, aren't we going to send it out? When did, is it good enough to go out? And um, she wrote back and said, you're right, I've sent it to 20 editors. Uh, okay, that was quick. <laughs> so um, John Glussman got it. And or you know looked at it and was interested in Norton, and um, he had edited uh, Mama's Last Hug. It's about chimpanzees and their emotional lives, and he had edited. I forget another, there was another title in there, but in any case, he had a history of working with scientists who are writing a book about their animals, primarily, explaining the behavior of those animals, but for non-technical audiences, right? For interested readers, interested adults is how I think of them. Uh, and um, so he saw this book proposal, and he saw one of the earlier chapters. And then that was his, I said, you know, Okay, if I'm going to revise this for Norton specifically and send you a full manuscript, um, what do you want to tell me from the book proposal? What do you want to tell me about it as I get it ready for me? Um, and he said, uh, more science, less memoir. And I said, anything else? And he said, um, he said 80,000 words. He's not a very... Uh, <laughs> Effusive, thank you. He's not a very effusive uh, editor. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted, and and, he, uh, and I tried to write to that. I, I I got depending on how you count, I either went slightly under or way over the word limit if you include the notes or not. So if that, that's the kind of feedback you're getting, which seems to be not very much, um, how how did the two of you negotiate? Of like, this is it. We got it. We got it. Um. I asked him, do you want it chapter by chapter, or do you want the whole book? He said, the whole book. So that was the first time he looked at it, the entire book. He read it. Uh, he sent it back with comments. Um, so he had marked up, well, I think he marks up paper, and his, his uh, assistant, executive assistant, marks up online. But I got it marked up. And um, mostly it was edits throughout the chapters. Do you, do you want to say this? Um, bad word choice, fix this, stuff like that. And there were, you know, I didn't count them, but there were a lot of them, hundreds of them, you know. But the, in, in 80,000 words, hundreds is not not a terrible, I, I felt okay with that. I've had editors who do worse on scientific papers, where I'm just like, I cannot believe you. That was the other thing. I'm very used to editors from um, scientific journals, which are other scientists reading your work who have a vested interest and um, come to my scientific writing class if you want to hear me vent about um, scientific reviewers. And then it goes to an editor who considers their job to be to just pass the reviewer's comments along. So a, a, lay, a, a book publishing company's editor was a new experience for me. I didn't know what to expect. Anyway, uh, then there were the chapters where he said, either at the, usually at the end of the chapter, after all these little comments along the way, he said, this didn't work for me, rewrite. And those chapters got cut and replaced. Um, and then the entire introduction uh, was uh, of, of the first draft. I also sent the book to Peter Godfrey Smith. I was going to send him just the bits where he's mentioned, because he shows up in the book. But he said, would you mind letting me read the whole thing? So uh, he, I sent it to him, and um, he made a comment about the first draft introduction. Um, which made me replace it entirely with what you read. Um, 
I have a question for the two uh, writing instructors in the room, if I may. We're out of time, James. Right? Uh, <laughs> that's not going to lie. I'm sorry. Um, so, the first sentence. The first sentence? Yes. The first sentence. I followed the octopus into the emerald void between the surface and the depths. So the book is being adapted, adopted for um, young reader audiences. And the age is, I think it was 8 to 14. They cut the word void and replaced it with empty space, which I'm not going to allow. But is the word void too difficult for middle readers? Uh, I've asked two grade school teachers. Now I'm asking our college writing instructors. They're looking to avoid something. Well, yeah. uh, I would say no. Uh, there's a writing journalist in the room, and one of the Wonderful. first things that you learn as a journalist is always to um, have a dirty mind. So bear with me on this. Uh, um, I see where you're going already. Things can be if it is possible for some, because some of the most hilarious headlines. <laughs> are double entendres about right. sex and body parts. Yeah. And they they only work if you're in fifth grade. And they come back to the writer, the headline writer, what were you thinking? Oh, I wasn't thinking, uh, well, that's a problem. I have a dirty mind. So, David, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out. Did you say feeding void to an eighth grader? Right. Could it possibly mean some right. body function? I could be working too hard here. Um, but, but, but that's where your mind went. <laughs> um, okay. You're taking your own advice, well done. Yes, thank you. But, you know, but a word like that can have multiple meanings. Yes. And that's important for yes. students to... Do you want to be the instructor to have to explain? <laughs> well, see, Daria, it's actually not that kind of void. I, 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 I fully take your point. Yes. It is remaking, re, re, uh, making me rethink <laughs> how I will respond to this, because this is on my desk this week. Um, but uh, it also occurs to me that at the appropriate age mm -hmm. uh, the, of these readers, mm -hmm. many of them might never have heard the word void used for a bodily function. Okay. I think that seems to me to be a, a rarer usage. More archaic almost. Right? Yeah. But, yeah, it's more... a good point. Think, think the, the possible... Tihi interpretations is an excellent. I hadn't crossed my mind before. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions from our students that we'd love to hear? Anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, Mark. I was just going to ask where can we see the Heidi documentary? The Heidi documentary is uh, was really it's called Octopus Making Contact. It was released by PBS. To the best of my knowledge, it's not available on the internet right now for free in that version. But you can buy the DVD from PBS, or if you're a PBS subscriber, it is available for streaming. It, this, a slightly longer version of the film, the same film with two added scenes, was released by BBC uh, overseas in under the title The Octopus in My House. Mm -hmm. And last time I checked online, if you Google the octopus in my house, BBC, and you look for videos, and just look at the length, find getting any royalties on the um, video, so enjoy. <laughs> Is the book available locally? Should be. Um, when it first came out, uh, a colleague and I went around and rattled the cages of all the bookstores in town. Hey, are you carrying this book? Why not? Where is it? Don't you think it's a local author? Don't you think it should be in the front of the store? What do you mean you only have one copy left? Did you sell out? How many copies did you sell? Yeah, so it was in town, but of course, I'm sure it sold out. Now. <laughs> but go check. Mm -hmm. Rattle the cages. I, I said we would wrap up at seven. Um, if you have, I, I, I want to ask one more question. Feel free, but I know that I have a question. Yes, Charlie. So, because you, your audience is so disparate, you know, is it difficult to write something 
for a lay audience while at the same time having enough science in it to please your colleagues? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking ahead of knowing whether or what my colleagues thought about this. Um, you know, my colleagues who are my friends and collaborators have read it, and of course they're all very polite people, so they were kind. But what's really interesting is, you know, what will it get cited in a scientific paper because it sparks someone's idea? Or um, will someone tell me, you are so full of crap in this book that I couldn't believe it, right? And I don't know how that's going to unfold yet. But um, what, what I did is I, I tried to represent the science as closely as I could, but at the same time, not to rely on too much technical language. And of course, I get caught all the time, like what constitutes technical language? Void had not occurred to me before as technical language. But mantle, the, the bag on the back of the octopus that some people think it's, is its head, it looks like this shiny extended forehead. The mantle, that's obviously technical language. And I use it very early in the book, and I don't explain it until much later, chapter four, I think. So there was a juggling act there. Um, when I was uh, in the first year of this study, I worked at the Prince William Sound Science Center in Cordova, and uh, there was a newly hired oceanographer there who was like fresh out of postdoctoral, and, you know, hard physical oceanographer, lots of math, lots of complicated things that you can't see about how the Earth's rotation affects the flow of water and eddies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he got up in Cordova, in a room like this, to give a talk to the fishermen about the science, uh, the oceanographic science behind the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And he gave his talk, and people didn't get it. And afterwards, he was like, you know, how come everybody didn't get it? And I said, well, you, you, you are really technical. You have to explain these things in a non-technical way. And he said, you can't. And I said, no, you can. You just have to figure out how. And um, in fact, in the oceanography chapter here, I explained some of the same things that he explained in his lecture, but hopefully in a more understandable way. I don't know yet what my colleagues will think of the octopus science in here. But I, one of the things I did was I was very, very careful not to say things that I thought I would deeply regret later. <laughs> So, you know, there's some things that I might have written in here and then I just thought, well, maybe not, or maybe not that way, or maybe in a footnote, you know. Some writers also want to take this into the book. Yeah. It says maybe it's not quite enough. Could, could we end with um, one thing? Yeah. Um, you, um, I'm guessing you're working with an editor in the city of New York. New York. Public City, East Coast PD. So it's pretty limited understanding. And here you have um, graphed, uh, included um, any number of references to the lives of Native people and their ways and their diet and their approach to the known world. And um, I'm thinking about the Yeah. We yeah, have any number of those stories. Did um, did your editors uh, resonate to those stories? Did they say, oh my goodness, um, we absolutely, that, that's one of the things that makes this book um, perfect for exotic aspects of Alaska, exotic to the East Coast, yes. were received. Yes, and, uh, yes that, the, the, the selling value of Alaska uh, was important in, in getting a contract for this book probably. But also, of course, indigenous rights, indigenous ways of thinking, and all of that is very big mm -hmm. as a topic right now. 
Yes, but not written by non-indigenous. Not written, not written by non-indigenous people. But nevertheless, uh, I got the impression that that was something that, if I did it well and did it right, mm -hmm. um, would be uh, also welcome and, and be a plus for the in the eyes of those very distant East Coast mm -hmm. markets. And the other audience that I worried about, besides how do you write to uh, interested adults as well as people who are technically invested in your industry, your science, the animal rights people. Oh, gosh. This bit that Rosen's picked out lands very badly with the animal rights people. So I'll just give you that warning. Okay. The explorative curiosity, like other abilities, seems embodied in the suckers and arm. I recall earlier in my study when I had gone subsistence foraging out of Chinika, I watched Mike Elishansky clean a just captured octopus for his supper. We were standing on the float that made up the small boat dock. I had seen other people, when butchering an octopus to cook, slid open the mantle, remove the internal organs, cut out the beak and associated muscles, and keep the meat of the head, mantle, and arms to eat. Wild foods were routine for Mike, and he went at it more simply. He sliced each arm off of the octopus at its base and tossed them one by one into a bucket. The head and mantle he discarded in the water. Just as he was finished, another man came along the float and chatted with Mike. How'd it go? Got this one, 12 pounds. They talked for a while about fishing, the weather, family, casual talk. As they chatted, I was fascinated to see the arms of the octopus, despite their separation from the head, feeling their way out of the bucket. They crawled, tip first, up the white plastic side. The first one made it several inches over the rim of the bucket before Mike glanced down and casually peeled it back sucker by sucker and dropped it to the bottom. The tip of the arm commenced the journey again, marching up sucker by sucker. Periodically throughout the next 20 minutes of the conversation, Mike would reach down peel loose the most advanced escaping arms and toss them back from where they would again begin anew. How are we to understand such absent-minded activity? And I read that last sentence, those of you who are looking in the book know that it's past the section break, to answer your earlier question, why this story? And that's why, because the rest of the chapter deals with the unique aspects of octopus anatomy that explain some of what I had observed in that bucket. But that bit has not gone down well with people who are a long way from the last. Is that issue you've, you've gotten letters, you've heard of? Uh, journalists and um, um, at least one uh, animal rights activist animal welfare activist, I think is more, more accurate, have uh, headlined their comments on the book with their account of that section rephrased in their own way out of context. Why would I read a book in which a man brutally slices up a living octopus and leaves its arms to crawl around the bucket? That kind of response. How could there be anything useful in a book And you, you wrote on um, Can you tell us just a little bit about your writing process? Um, because we get stories like this where we feel we spend our time. Um, do you spend a day in the field and you know, go home that night and start making out your notes about writing a notebook? Or do you carry the notebook with you? Do you listen to a poem? How do you, um, what, what is your writing process? So a lot of these stories um, that are in the book uh, happened in 1995 and 1996, actually, in between those books. And at that time, um, I was only just starting to think about writing a book. I didn't decide, write a book, go and do the work to collect the information for the book. I was doing the work. I thought, this is surreal. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I should write a book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I never even thought about, these conversations were not interviews or anything. I just they are doing the biology. And I never 
thought about recording the interviews. So what happened instead is, is more like you said, I would, I, would car I would carry a journal with me in the field, and I tried to journal every night. And so some of these very specific details are drawn from those journal accounts. In some cases, what I wrote here is only lightly edited from the journal account. Um, but in other cases, you know, I polished the language and you know, all of that. But the, the detail, I tried to be true to the detail. But that whole description of Simeon Kardashian Jr. with the cigarette yeah. and the orange lock of hair and all of that was just like that night after walking back to the, the lodging that night. I just sat down and thought, well, why don't I just write a character study of my fashion? Started writing that. Um, so yeah, it was, and then later on, some of the later episodes that aren't in that early period, sometimes I had, I, it was 25 years in the making before I really sat down and wrote this. And sometimes in those 25 years, I had just given up. I just wasn't doing it anymore. And I, I wish in some ways that I had continued, but it, it also would have been one more thing to do in an already full life. So I, um, but I had scientific notes, I had field logs of where I was and what I was and what had happened, I had dive logs, I had photographs. And the photographs all, because once we went to digital photography, every photograph has a date on it, right? And so um, I, I used all of those references to um, evoke the moment again. And we would be remiss in not commenting on the fact that it comes to us from Iak. Is that correct? Yes, Salak Zuk. Uh, my pronunciation may be butchered, um, but in Iak, it means uh, a bunch of things under a rock, and it is their word for octopus. Yes. And so. Uh, That's poetry. Yeah, isn't it? Many things under a rock. Thank you so much. Really Thank you. David, for